of you who weren't here yesterday, um, I ended by talking about this study, which, uh, so the, the topic that I ended with, the general topic was situated cognition, and roughly that's uh, the view according to which in order to understand cognition, one has to understand the environment in which the mind is operating. And um, Suparna and I have been talking for a number of, well, years really, about, think, about trying to make sense of this notion in the context of neuroscience. And I ended with a study that looks like it might be a kind of a step in that direction. This is a genetic study um, looking at particular genetic properties of uh, genes that code for the oxytocin receptors. The oxytocin is an endogenous uh, brain-produced hormone and the receptor is the thing that it binds to. And there are different genetic variants that in different people that code for this receptor. And remarkably, in my view, uh, different genetic variants seem to correlate with different uh, social behaviors. So this study looked at uh, help-seeking behavior in a context of high stress, and it compared Native Koreans and Korean Americans. Uh, and what it found, in short, is that uh, those Korean Americans with a certain uh, genetic variant were more likely to uh, seek help under conditions of stress than those with the other variant. But this didn't hold true in, in, Kore in the Korean population, which is to say, uh, whatever variant you had, uh, you were not likely to seek help under conditions of stress, or not very much. And the proposed explanation for this is that uh, this gene, as it were, doesn't code for help-seeking behavior. It codes for something, uh, namely help-seeking help behavior, only when the social conditions license that kind of behavior. So in the United States, help-seeking behavior is okay, and so if you've got this variant, you're going to uh, engage in that behavior because your culture says it's okay. In Korea, uh, you're not going to engage in that behavior. So what this looks like is a genetic feature that has a behavioral consequence only in a certain kind of environment. Okay? Let me say one other thing about this, and I'm going to ask Daniel to make a couple of comments. He, here's the basic idea, without worrying about the details of this study, here's the basic idea. This is an, uh, an idea that comes from a book by a um, psychiatric geneticist, very distinguished geneticist called Kenneth Kendler. So Kendler imagines the following hypothetical situation. You have someone who works on cancer, and she finds a gene that seems to correlate with uh, high incidence of lung cancer. So she publishes the study in Nature, uh, and the study says uh, a new oncogene has been found. Now, it turns out that what this gene actually codes for is something in the dopamine system that leads to a different response, different neural response to cigarette smoke than uh, the dopamine system that doesn't, that isn't coded for by this gene, okay? So what in fact happens is someone who's got this gene takes a puff of a cigarette, it's much more likely to become addicted and much more likely therefore to develop lung cancer. So Ken, uh, Kendler says, is this an oncogene or not, right? Well, in one sense, no, because this gene doesn't, as it were, lead directly biologically in the body of the person to lung cancer, but in another sense, yes. It's an oncogene in the sense that it's a gene such that in the right environment, namely an environment in which tobacco is available, will in fact be a cause, one of the causes of uh, increased lung cancer. So he calls this outside the skin gene expression, and I think this is not exactly like that, but it's quite similar it's to say, Whatever this gene codes for, it codes for something that manifests itself only when the environment is appropriate. And it's in that sense, this is a bit like uh, what Lawrence was talking about yesterday, having to do with certain kinds of looping. It's in that sense that uh, the gene correlates with a certain kind of social behavior. Okay, okay. Um, I mean this actually is connected to the, the main theme of uh, the, the, the stuff we're supposed to do now. Um, and I might get, be able to come back to this at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. Um, so so uh, the brief today is to talk about reductionism. And, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to talk from the point of view mostly of a philosopher, um, since that's my point of view. Uh, I'm going to try to make things nice and accessible. There shouldn't be anything complicated here. Um, I'm, I'm afraid the slides are very wordy today for a reason you'll see in a second, so I apologize for that. I 
I didn't have time to find good pictures for everything. And anyhow, you need the words. So, okay. So remember yesterday, I generated the, this, these three theses that I said were constitutive of kind of the mainstream view, mainstream uh, broadly understood. And we talked about this first one yesterday. So today we're going to talk about this one. And uh, this one, I mean, the, the idea that the mind is identical to the brain is something that I talk about in the context of philosophical theorizing. What I'm going to try to do today is not so much question the truth of this as much as try to suggest that what this actually means is a bit complicated. And whether you think it's true or not is going to depend on, on in fact, what you mean by it. Okay? So I know that sounds terribly irritating and sort of you know, the sort of thing philosophers do. Uh, but I'm going to try to convince you this is actually a case where what you mean by what you say does actually make real difference to science. So I'll apologize for being a philosopher. I'll apologize for whatever you want me to apologize for. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Now, let me give you a sense of why this, is, why this is so directly relevant. Instead of saying that the mind is identical to the brain, here's my critical neuroscience version of this, right? A successful or final or ultimate or whatever adequate theory of the mind will be an exclusively neuroscientific theory. That I take to be a kind of reasonably careful formulation, both of what we're seeing in the popular mind and what I take it most neuroscientists actually believe, some version of this. Okay? And there are lots and lots of popular books in which something like this popular books by neuroscientists in which this kind of thing gets articulated. I mean, it's unfortunate you never see this kind of thing articulated in a paper because no one would have the balls to say this in a paper. Um, but this is, I, I think, what most people do in fact believe. But that, that's a kind of sociological question. Now, this is directly relevant to critical neuroscience in the following sense. Attacking that claim is kind of like the nuclear option, right? In the following sense. If we thought this was false, Right? and we could convince people that this was false, then there's a sense in which critical neuroscience would have done much of what it wants to do. Because suppose we convince people that this was false, right? So suddenly uh, no more pe there's no more books on the brain diet and brain and sex. And be because, or and there might be, but it's going to be the brain diet or it could be the kidney diet or it could be the mind diet. It could be any number of things, right? Because if it's not just the brain, then it's kind of now it's an open question what's going to be of interest. So there's a sense in which if people were convinced that this were false, then I take it a lot of the air would be, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of the, the hype would come out of neuroscience in a good way because then we'd be able to see what neuroscience is really going to do for us. And I, so I should say, by the way, I always have to, I start these talks with, again, a clarification. I'm not against the brain. I love the brain. When I started giving talks like this, people said, oh, it's one of these philosophers who didn't understand anything. He's, he thinks that, you know, I love the brain. My, the brain is, uh, like Woody Allen used to say, right, it's my second favorite organ. I'm all for the brain. So I take it this doesn't have to be said that much in this context because we're all in favor of the brain. What we're interested in is a kind of, you know, nuanced view about what the brain can do for us. Okay, so the idea here now, this is a claim about science, about neuroscience. And the way philosophers and other people uh, put this sometimes is to say that the mind sciences will be reduced to neuroscience. So that's why the, top, the topic of the, or what this area is called is reductionism. Okay? And I'm going to say something about reductionism. So first let me tell you what reductionism is supposed to be. This is, I call this classical reductionism because it's the sort of thing that got discussed a whole lot in the 60s, 70s, 80s by philosophers of science, especially philosophy of biology. Um, it's not the only idea that you could have about what reductionism is. And I'll say in a minute, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'll say in a minute that whether this is exactly how you conceive of reductionism is not going to matter a huge amount. But just so you know, uh, if you want to know at least one version, one rigorous version of, of reductionism, it's this. Okay. Um, so let's start with what reductionism is in general. Redu the, the crucial thing about reductionism as I'm going to understand it, is that reductionism is a relation among scientific theories. Okay? So it's a view about science, and that's going to turn out to be very important. It's not a view about the world. It's a view about theories. So it's a relation between two theories. One is usually called the reduced theory, and the other is the reducing theory. So we have some laws of a reduced theory, and then we have some reducing theory, which is usually thought of as somehow more fundamental, more basic. There's all sorts of stuff about the, you know, the, 
the hierarchy of the sciences, which we could talk about if you want. Um, and then there are what are called bridge laws, that are basically definitions that hold between these two theories. And reduction is the process, or you've achieved reduction when you can derive the laws of the reduced theory by using the reducing theory. So the idea is very much, it's very old fashioned in a certain kind of way. It's a bit like this. Bridge laws are a little bit like the axioms of a mathematical theory, right? So suppose you, know, you start geometry with a bunch of axioms, right? A point is the intersection of two lines, a line is the shortest of two points, and so on, right? And then you prove things with those axioms. So the idea is take some theory, take some axioms like that, and prove the laws. And if you can prove those laws, you've reduced, you've reduced the laws, or you've redu reduced the theory in which the laws occur. All right, let's take an example. It's a lot easier to see. So here's a kind of a standard example of reductionism, uh, successful reduction. Let's take Mendel's laws. So before we had molecular biology, we had the laws of genetics that were you know, uh, uh, formulated by Mendel. Um, molecular biology comes along and we say, ah, maybe this thing that we call DNA, let's not worry about exactly what part of the DNA, let's, you know, let's just keep it vague for the time being. Maybe this thing DNA is what Mendel meant, or is what satisfies the description that Mendel had, the, the, the description uh, of the gene that Mendel had in mind. So let's, let's define, right, let's sort of hypothesize that DNA is, is the same thing as, is, 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 the, is the gene. Now, let's take the resources of molecular biology and the definition of the gene as identical to, uh, to DNA, and see if we can prove Mendel's laws, derive Mendel's laws from, from, that, from, from those resources. If we can, then we've successfully reduced Mendelian genetics to molecular biology. That's the gist of it, okay? So let's take a case of neuroscience. So presumably the theory of interest or some, some part of the theory of interest is gonna be theories that occur in psychology. So let's take learning as an example. Uh, so we've, we're interested in trying to reduce learning theory, or psychology of learning. So we're gonna look at neuroscience, particularly the, the part of neuroscience that is relevant to learning as we understand it. And we'll look at some places where we might get a link between psychology and neuroscience. We might speculate, aha, let's suppose classical conditioning is some change in a Hebbian synapse. I'm just making this up, okay? So we say, aha, what, what, what psychologists mean by classical, no, not what they mean. When psychologists talk about classical conditioning, they are in fact referring to changes in Hebbian synapses. Okay, now let's ask, if we take the neuroscience that's relevant to learning and these bridge laws that uh, identify psychological concepts with neural concepts, can we derive uh, the laws of the psychological laws of learning uh, from those resources. If we can, then we've reduced the psychology of learning to neuroscience. Okay. I'll just pause here for a second to make sure you don't have any questions about about that. All right. Okay. Now, I, I don't want to belabor this because you might be someone who doesn't believe in exactly this version of reductionism. There are philosophers who don't, and no doubt other people. Um, Leaving aside the details, okay, the basic impulse here, the basic idea here is, is perfectly straightforward. It's that uh, whatever is going on when one theory takes over the work of the other, it involves in some way moving the first theory to one side and saying we can explain the same phenomena we, we, we were trying to explain before with a new theory. And by the way, right, this is why we like reductionism, the theory is more fundamental, we get deeper explanation, we might explain things we couldn't explain before, we can correct mistakes that the original theory made, and so on. So we get some benefits uh, for doing it that way. So when we have molecular genetics, we now understand genetics in a way that Mendel couldn't possibly have understood it. In particular, uh, we can now begin to understand how we can manipulate genes. We can do all sorts of things. So you get benefits according to the standard view, not just in understanding, but also maybe in application, by having a reduction occur because you're moving to this more fundamental uh, level of explanation. 
Okay, that's why we want it. Oh, I see. No, reduction doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it, it may be the case. There may be some sense to which that happens. In the general view about it is, in a certain sense, you're opening up to things because you're understanding nature in a more fundamental way. So uh, it may be true that the objects you're going to talk about now may be more limited, for example, right? So I don't know, suppose it turns out that classical conditioning and habituation and sensitization, suppose it turns out lots of elementary learning all turns out to be, you know, different, the, the behavior of different kinds of Hebbian synapses. Ah, that would be a narrowing, right? Because now we're not talking about classical conditioning and habituation, right? We're talking about Hebbian synapses. But in a, se in a sense, that, that's a narrowing that we want. Why? Because that unifies a field that was previously a mess, right? Or it was diverse. Now we've got simple, elegant explanation. And that's what scientists aim for, right? So thank you. The idea is to take the original domain and explain everything, uh, but in a better way. Now, it could turn out, I mean, so I mean, there's lots of variants on this, and we could talk about this. One thing that could happen, you could narrow it in a certain way that, again, I take it would be beneficial. There could be something in the original theory that turns out to be a mistake. Right? And when you, when you take the whole theory and you, and you explain, explain the domain more fundamentally, you say, ah, that doesn't make sense. We get rid of that. That was a mistake. So that, that would be narrowing the, the, the subject matter in a certain way, but in a way that presumably is good. Okay? All right. Um, now, so notice, first of all, as soon as you see this, right, notice that uh, some unclarity in this, in this notion of reductionism appears immediately in the, in the context of neuroscience. Why? The following reason. People say, aha, neuroscience will explain the mind. Well, what do you mean by neuroscience? If you mean by neuroscience the, the things, you know, the stuff that people who call themselves neuroscientists do, then that's obviously true, right? I mean, Amir works on brain imaging, but he's interested in behavior. He's interested in explaining how people think about things and how they respond to things and so on. That's, that's what we call cognitive neuroscience. So if you're saying, well, look, Cognitive neuroscience will reduce psychology. That's not very controversial because cognitive neuroscience is neuroscience plus psychology, right? So it's not, it wouldn't be an achievement. It wouldn't be a radical claim to say that Amir's work is going to explain, is going to reduce the theory of placebos in a way, right? That's not going to give us deep insight. It's going to add some stuff, but we expect that to be the case. On the other hand, the idea that will reduce the theory of placebos to neurobiology, where by neurobiology we could mean different things, but roughly cell, cell assemblies, neurotransmitters, and so on, uh, that's a controversial and radical claim. Because that means we no longer have to talk about things like expectation, for example, or whatever. We're now going to just talk about properties of the brain. So what you mean by the claim that neuroscience is going to reduce psychology is now important. That's one way in which what you mean by your, your words matters. Okay. What I want to do now is just take you through a number of arguments in favor of reductionism in the neurosciences and the sciences of the mind and uh, suggest why they're not terribly successful. Okay? Now, these arguments are kind of arguments I've made up with other people. Uh, and the ones that I'm going to focus on are ones that I take to be arguments that would have some uh, intuitive appeal both to neuroscientists and to people in general. Okay, so in that sense, again, I'm trying to stay in the critical neuroscience mode here by focusing on ideas that are, in some sense, philosophical, but they're ideas that wouldn't be of interest only to philosophers who are talking to one another. They might actually have some sway in uh, move, you know, moving people in one direction or another. The, one of these arguments that I'll, I'll mention in a second is, I think, one of the, the or sources of confusion about neuroscience, particularly among neuroscientists. So we'll get that in a sec. So here's the first reason why you might think reductionism in the science of the mind is going to happen. And it's just that this is reductionism, reduction is just what happens in science, right? You know, so you take Mendel. Mendel, you know, does his work and then we make progress and we discover that we can explain Mendelian genetics in a better way. This is just kind of two and two is four. This is just what happens in the history, in the history of science. So Given that we're talking about some branch of science, there's every reason to expect it to be true in this branch of science. Okay? So before we consider this argument, let's, let's get some examples on the table of successful reductions in science. So I mentioned genetics. 
What are some others? Thermodynamics. Okay. Good. What's another one? How about uh, electricity and magnetism in special relativity? Okay. What about a fourth? It starts to be hard to say, right? This is meant to be a demonstration, not to, right? <laughs> it starts to be hard to say, right, to point to classical cases of reduction. Uh, now, I'm a historian of science. Is anyone here kind of, I know no one's here a historian of science, but does anyone have a kind of amateur interest? Okay, so I take it that, in fact, reductionism, and this may be the, flaw, the fault of philosophers, that reductionism is kind of the way, you know, this picture of science that you get by watching television or sitting in your armchair, right? It's not a picture of science that most historians of science, I think, would think is terribly helpful. That's just, again, a speculation. I'm not an expert. But I think the idea that somehow reduction, that you have these, you know, high-level sciences that, as science progresses, gradually get taken over by more and more and more fundamental sciences on their way to, you know, I don't know what, quantum mechanics or something, relativistic quantum mechanics, that's, that's a kind of, that's a picture of the universe that philosophers like, right? Because it's neat and it's elegant and it's simple, but in fact, it doesn't seem to correspond to how science actually works. So immediately, right, we should ask ourselves, what is it about this idea of reduction that we find so obvious and so compelling in the face of the fact that it doesn't happen very often. Even in physics, there's a wonderful paper by a philosopher called Tim Maudlin about uh, the, the grand unifying theory, right? The guts and, and the theory of everything and so on. And he talks, about, he talks about the sociology of physicists, right? Physicists, in general, expect there to be such a theory. And he shows that, in fact, it's not as likely as people might think. Uh, just in, in, in virtue of looking at the history of physics. So if it's not that common in physics, where we understand what we're doing, then I think we should at least be open-minded about whether it's going to happen in neuroscience, where we don't understand what we're doing. All right, so that's my answer to, that's my reply to this argument. This, I think, is the most important argument. That was really just to clear away some debris. Th this is, I think, the most important argument in, in the area, and I'm going to spend some time on it. This is an argument that explicitly refers to mind-brain identity, and so it goes back to this thesis that I started with, that the mind is identical to the brain. So here's a little argument. Sorry, this is why they have to be words, because I want to show you the argument in detail. So here's a little argument that I think is very plausible. Uh, the mind is identical to nothing more than the brain, right? The science of the brain is neuroscience. Therefore, the science of the mind is or will be neuroscience. Now, the mind is identical to the brain. That's something we all believe, right? Well, many of us. OK, well, if you don't believe it, then you're better off than any, than any of us because you're not going to worry about any of this thing, right? So I'm now, I'm now talking to the people. I'm, try, I'm trying to convince more people to be like you, OK? So, so I mean, I happen to believe this because there's a way to understand it, in which I take it to be true. Um, We'd have to qualify it, but I, I do take it to be something that many, many people do believe, and that many and I take it to be the, something that neuroscientists believe. That's the crucial thing here. The science of the brain is neuroscience. That can't be, you can't question that, right? That's just a, def, that's just a semantic thing. We call the science of the brain neuroscience. So it looks like it follows that the science of the mind is going to be neuroscience. The complete science of the mind is going to be neuroscience, right? That, doesn't, that seem like a, doesn't that seem like a plausible argument? OK, so look. One reason why I think this is important is because when I, when I have actually talked to neuroscientists or I've uh, talked to people who know about neuroscientists' views, this is often what they cite as evidence for the centrality of neuroscience, right? They cite the patently true claim, according to them, and, and indeed according to me in some sense, um, according to which the mind is the brain. So what, what could it, I mean, what, it seems obvious, right, that the science of the mind must be a science of the brain. And, and there's a sense in which I'm going to say that's true. But this argument is a bad argument. And the easiest way to see, for philosophers anyhow, that an argument's a bad argument is to show you an argument that's exactly the same in structure, but it's clearly a bad argument. So here's my version of it. Earthquakes are identical to nothing more than the movement of many physical particles. 
The science of physical particles is particle physics. Therefore, the science of earthquakes is or will be particle physics, right? Now, that's clearly a bad argument, even though it's structurally exactly the same as this argument. So that argument, if this is a bad argument, this must be a bad ar argument. Is that, do you, that's okay, right? Okay. I mean, do we agree that this is a bad argument? You might not agree. Some hard-headed reductionist might disagree with this. Okay. Anyhow, we could talk about that. Now, this is a bad argument, presumably, for the following reason. It is obviously true that earthquakes are identical to the movement of physical particles. I, I don't know anything about earthquakes. So if I'm wrong about it, then just let's suppose, right? <laughs> I mean, we could take any, some physical phenomenon. Um, I take it that earthquakes are large quantities of molecules or particles moving around in a certain way. And it is true that the science of physical particles is particle physics. That's obviously true because that's true by definition. This isn't true, though, because this thing talks about facts about the universe, right? This is a metaphysical claim about what is constituted of what. And this is a claim about science. And these two things, therefore, are not talking about the same thing, right? Of course it's true that from God's point of view, there's nothing more to earthquakes than movements of particles. But we don't do science from God's point of view. We do it from our point of view. And from our point of view, the only way we can understand earthquakes is by plate tectonics or whatever theory is the best theory, right? So what that means, in effect, is that plate tectonics, in some non-standard way, is a theory of particles. What else would it be a theory of, right? It's not a theory of souls. It just doesn't talk about part. I mean, it's talking about the object's particles, but it's not using the concept particles. Similarly, neuroscience, uh, sorry, um, uh, the, uh, the mind is nothing more than, a, than, than uh, a bunch of neurons, right? Let's suppose, that seems clearly right. And so psychology, anthropology, sociology, in some sense, is a theory of the brain, right? What else, I mean, leaving it, there, yeah. Again, what I, want to, what I want to do here is I want to grant the hardcore reductionist everything they, they want, right? So I want to say, look, the hardcore reductionist is going to deny emergentism. I want to say, deny it, fine. Put all the spatial information in the, in the, in the low-level description. Now, I, I, I agree with you, though, about this idea. I don't mean to be making a semantic point here. It's a semantic point that has a, a substantive claim behind it. And the substantive claim is really simple. It's this, that we confuse what we take to be true about the universe, about how God sees the universe, what the universe is like in some, in some big, fuzzy, possibly true sense, with facts about how science is done and how it happens. And the idea is something like this. It's a very natural idea to have. You sort of think, well, look, you think about the universe as if you were God, and you see that it's nothing but particles moving around, and you can look at it at different levels and all that sort of thing. And you think, aha, uh -huh. if we could only do it, maybe it's not possible, but if we could only do it, we could describe all the particles moving around, we'd have described everything, because that's all there is, right? And what we, what we omit, apart from these kinds of issues, there's lots of things we might be omitting, but at a minimum, what we omit is just some basic, unfortunate, unexplained facts about how human beings can conceive of things as manifested by their science, which is that Sometimes you can conceive of it here, and sometimes you can conceive of it there. And nobody knows why, uh, but it's just a kind of an, a, a brute, unfortunate fact. So here's what I mean. If someone said, listen, genetics is terrific. I love molecular biology, but wouldn't it be great to have a, a, a theory of genetics expressed in, in relativistic quantum mechanical terms? Wouldn't that be more fundamental? Wouldn't we get so much more out of that, right? So you put in a grant application. You say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to reduce genetics. Well, one, I mean, maybe, I'm not saying it couldn't be done, um, but one natural response to that is, look, why bother? We have a very, very good understanding of genetics at the level of molecules. Why is it at the level of molecules? Why? What's the answer? I don't know. Nobody knows, right? Why is it that things seem to, that we can understand things or that we've grasped how things work at the level of molecules? In principle, for God, Right, God could see patterns at the level of, of quarks, that the quarks that constitute the molecules, right? Could be. And maybe one day we'll see it that way too. But the, the thought is something like this. Don't, I mean, this is an anti-philosophy claim, right? Don't let the philosophical impulse we all have for things to be elegant and simple and straightforward, don't let that interfere with facts about how science has actually gone. Okay, that, that's really all this boils down to.
So it seems to me that, there's, as I say, there's just some facts that I can't explain about how the history of science has gone. And the history of science has gone such that we happen to understand earthquakes at a level of plate tectonics. That's a pattern that we've latched on. I don't say we're making it up, it's a real pattern. Maybe you think it's something over and above the things, maybe you don't. We've grasped that pattern at the level of those, that size of object, or that quantity of objects. Uh, in the case of genetics, the relevant patterns seem to be either, they either exist or we have access to them at the level of molecules. Some other patterns we have access to at other levels. Right? So even though everything ultimately, let's suppose, is made up of quarks or whatever your favorite subatomic particles are, that could be perfectly true without that having any consequences whatsoever for what science is going to explain what. That's really all I'm saying. So, sorry, sorry about just one sec. So, so the fact that psychology is talking about the very same thing that neuroscience is talking about, I mean, what else is it talking about? It's not talking about the kidney. It's not talking about your elbow. It's talking about your brain, right? Remember what your brain does. The fact that psychology is talking about your brain and neuroscience is talking about your brain doesn't yet tell us anything about which science is going to succeed. It's a separate question from how the universe is made up. Okay, so let me let me try again. I'm I'm okay. So l let me let, let me let me back up a bit. So first of all, I I should have said I'm I'm using the word psychology. I, I'm using lots of words in a kind of rough and ready way. Uh, maybe I should use the word psychological sciences or something. Right? It doesn't much matter what we use. What I mean is the science is interested in human beings and what they do, what they think, how they behave, and so on. Uh, lump all of those together, okay? Throw in anthropology, throw in sociology, throw in all that stuff. The people whose views I'm addressing, not yours, I understand. I mean, we, we have different views here. The people whose views I'm addressing are people who want to say something like this. Listen, of course anthropology is important. Of course you know, there, there is a thing called culture, and cultures emerge as a result of people living in certain ways and talking and using tools. All of that's true. But, you know, ultimately, right? Now, get in the spirit of it with me, right? Ultimately, right? Uh, ultimately, what does that boil? And I've heard people say this. I'm not making this up, right? What does that boil down to? It boils to, I mean, Lawrence even used a phrase like this, right? It's a bunch of brains, you know, housed in bodies, but okay, it's a bunch of brains interacting in certain complex ways with other physical objects, sure. You know, over time, sure. In an environment, sure. But ultimately, where does culture come from? Would culture have arisen without brains? Of course not, right? Trees don't have culture. You know, amoebas don't have culture. You need a brain to have culture. And ultimately, if you want to understand culture, you could understand it by looking at the complicated history of brains in action. Okay. Right? That, that, that's all I mean. Now, again, I'm not saying I believe this. But you get the idea. Now, determinism, as I understand it, is a view about whether, with a set of initial conditions, a certain outcome is inevitable. That, that's a claim about the way the world works. And I want to leave that completely to one side, and I don't think it's implied by anything I'm saying here. In particular, you see, you might say, if you're a hardcore reductionist, you, might, you believe that everything is reducible to quantum mechanics or relativistic quantum mechanics. It's built into your own theory that not everything is deterministic, because there's indeterminism in quantum mechanics. Right? So these things are completely separate, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, let me say a word about Lawrence's point. Suppose we're thinking about earthquakes, right? So here's, here's a particle, and here's a particle, and here. And, and these four particles are the four of the particles moving around as a result of the earthquake. One thing you might say is, look, when you put four particles together, now you have a pattern, right? Very simple. It's a spatial pattern. And you might, in fact, even have a way of describing the pattern independently of the particles, right? We do. We have geometry and topology. That pattern emerges out of a bunch of things coming together in a certain way. That's a very, very simple kind of emergentism, okay? Now, one thing that reductionists say, no one denies this because it would be silly to deny it. It's obviously true. What they say is, sure, it emerges. But look, ultimately, it's not made up of anything new. We're not, nothing new has arisen. What's arisen is a kind of a thing we're describing. If you think, if you think it, the pattern itself is genuinely new, notice that I could reconstruct the pattern from the individual objects, right? There's no new information here, is the idea. That's one, one thing that people say. Now, in response to that, many emergentists say, yes, that's true of simple examples like this, 
I could reconstruct the information just by talking about the fundamental objects. But there will be contexts, especially contexts of very complicated things, in which patterns begin to emerge that don't look like they could be reconstructed from the fun more fundamental information. Something genuinely new comes into the world that wasn't there before. Right? That, that's, I think, and that's the really interesting form of emergentism. And it is, and I don't know what to say about it. One thing I do want to say about it, though, is, so whenever, right, whenever philosopher says, I don't know what to say, of course, they immediately tell you what they, what they think. One thing that I think is true about that, and this is the confusion, I think, or the difficulty of the problem, not the confusion. Suppose you were convinced that something new arises with complicated, complicated objects, however that happens. That's a kind of a mystery now, right? We suddenly, at a moment in evolution, something new ap appears. And we can't explain that new thing in terms of the old thing. That begins to sound, to me, very much like a kind of dualism, right? Because we now have something that has appeared which can't be taken apart in terms of its elements, right? You can't, ex it's a mystery, it's a, something genuinely new arises. Now, the worry that many philosophers have, I think, is that emergentism is going to just recreate the problem of mind-brain dualism by introducing a mystery in terms of dynamical properties that we had before in terms of uh, souls. Right? So it looks like there's a kind of dilemma here. Either you have a pattern that can be explained by taking it apart and reconstructing it, or you have a pattern that's so genuinely new you have no idea how it's related to the things that, it's, that it rose out of. And that looks like it's every bit as difficult and complicated as the thing we're trying to sort out. Okay. All right, so look, I, I, I've gone on about this maybe too long, but I, I do think that this is driving a lot of people's thinking, not driving it. Most neuroscientists maybe never think about this. If you were to say to a neuroscientist, though, is this a good reason for believing that the, the science of the brain is going to do it? I think this, this is something that most people would, would assent to. Okay, let me move on to the third one. So now we're getting... I've sort of organized this in terms of increasing desperation, right? So let's suppose I've convinced you of the first thing, right? So now you're, you're hanging on by, you know, your hands now. Uh, and so you go on to say something else. So here's something that, again, I think we hear all the time. This, in a certain way, is a, a, the, a central focus of critical neuroscience, right? I've given you one quote. This is from a philosopher called Paul Churchland from a book called the engine of reason, the seat of the soul. Paul Churchland is, uh, is a wonderful philosopher. He and his wife, Pat Churchland, I should really say Pat Churchland and her husband, Paul Churchland, are the two figures most associated with a certain philosophical view according to which neuroscience is going to do the explaining. Okay? So Pat Churchland kind of invented a field called, the field called neurophilosophy and has, been a, you know, has created a, single-handedly created a field. Um, and has given lots of philosophical arguments for this kind of reductionism. And one thing I think is, is true, one, one methodology I've used as a philosopher is, if you want to know what many neuroscientists think, if they were to think about this in a complicated way, if they had the time, look at what the Churchlands believe, and you'll find that that's what neuroscientists agree to. And, and I mean that not just kind of in principle, but I mean Pat Churchland is someone who goes to labs and talks to neuroscientists, and she is, in a certain way, as I, as I see the field, a kind of spokesman for the theoretical underpinnings of neuroscience. That, that's my view. I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. Uh, in fact, there are very few people who believe, uh, who believe what Churchland believes in, with the, in the full extent of it. There are some. She's not, she is not the only one, but, but uh, I wouldn't put Dennett there. So here's something from Paul Churchland. Uh, and now this is, uh, okay, so I'll just read it. Recent research into neural networks, both in animals and in artificial models, has produced the beginnings of a real understanding of how the biological brain works, a real understanding that is of how you work and everyone else like you. We are now in a position to explain how our vivid sensory experience arises in the sensory cortex of our brains, how the smell of baking bread, the sound of an oboe, the taste of a peach, and the color of a sunrise are all embodied in a vast chorus of neural activity. Now, okay, this is also, this is a long time ago now. You can find this among neuroscientists too. Francis Crick used to say things like this. Semir Zeki. Semir Zeki actually takes pokes at philosophers whenever he says things like this. Um, so, and, and this, I, I think, really is something that most people believe. If people didn't believe this, 
then they wouldn't be buying sex in the brain and the, the brain diet and change your, change your pants, change your brain or whatever, right? Um, uh, this, I think, really does capture the hype that underpins the thing that we're interested in. Now, I don't have, you know, I had a teacher called David Lewis. He was a, the greatest metaphysician probably since Leibniz. He was a great figure and he died very young. And he had very strange views. Um, it, particularly, he had the view that there were these things called possible worlds that really existed, that weren't in space-time, but they were real entities. They were like numbers. And, and uh, he used these, this notion of possible world to explain a whole lot of things. He had a very, very elaborate, very sophisticated system. And um, nobody believed it, right? Everyone agreed that David Lewis was the smartest man alive, but no other philosopher except for one believed that stuff. And Lewis used to, when he wrote stuff, he would reply to objections. And there was one objection that he would call the incredulous stare, right? And the, incre the incredulous stare is the objection that goes, huh, what? <laughs> what, right? And his answer to that objection was, I can't answer the incredulous stare. And so this, I, my answer to this is just the incredulous stare. I mean, I think this is just, it's just false. I mean, I have nothing else to say but that it's false. Um, and I actually, I'm rather, I'm annoyed with people like Paul Churchland because, you know, I mean, it, it, does, it does neuroscience a disservice, right? By, by saying that we can and have done more than we, we have done. I think it's just, it's just clearly false. So again, this is not an audience where I need to belabor this, but I think, I think uh, there's an awful lot of this. Okay? It's also interesting, by the way, bizarrely, I can't understand, the things that he focuses on are, are the things that would be the very last thing that any neuroscientist would say they could explain, right? The very, very last thing. Neuroscientists, maybe not in 1995, but now every sophisticated neuroscientist would say, Phenomenal consciousness, the smell of things, the taste of things, the sound of things, this is the last thing we're going to explain, if we ever explain it, right? So I, I don't know what's going on here. I mean, anyhow. Okay. So um, here's my fourth argument. Now I, we're holding on by the tips of our fingers. Uh, and I, I think of this as the wish fulfillment argument. And it goes like this. Look, it has to, we have to reduce psychology to neuroscience. Because if we don't reduce psychology to neuroscience, then we're stuck with psychology. And psychology is really crap. <laughs> I mean, to put it bluntly, right? And, and I mean that not, and I don't mean that in a, in a I don't mean, I mean, I'm, I obviously intend to get a laugh, but what I have in mind something, I have in mind something specific, okay? One of the things that people say about psychology, and that seems to me patently true, is that there aren't any laws in psychology, right? I mean, there are a handful. So think of a place in psychology I've done this for, been doing this for years, and I, I always ask audiences because I, I really want more examples. Think of a place in psychology where we have a theory that looks remotely like a theory in a natural science, which is to say a real model that makes predictions, that explains thing, rig, things rigorously. You know, of the na give me, I, I'll take the narrowest bit of psychology. It's very hard to find one. I mean, my opinion is that I can only think of one two remotely plausible candidates. One is elementary learning, classical conditioning, habituation, sensitization, okay? That's a place where we have, at the level of psychology, a real, I mean, this, again, it's an irony here, right? Behaviorism is supposed to be dead, finished, a, a waste of time, a delusion. Behaviorism, okay, so now I'm sorry to sound like a preacher, behaviorism gave us the only real psychological theories we've ever had, okay? The rescorla wagner model, so people still work on classical conditioning. It, behaviorism is not dead. It's alive in Philadelphia and other places. <laughs> okay, Rescorla, the Rescorla-Wagner model of classical conditioning. I mean, Rescorla is still alive. I don't know about Wagner. Um, this is a mathematical model of how conditioning works. And it really explains conditioning, and it really makes predictions about timing and repetition, all sorts of things, right? There's nothing remotely like this in psychology. Um, so, it, so here's the real problem. Suppose we believed, and this is a problem for me. I mean, this is a problem I worry about. If we don't have neuroscience, then we're stuck with something that looks like it's never, ever going to be anything like a natural science. And if it's not like a natural science, then there's a sense in which we're never going to be able to understand the mind in the way we want to understand it, right? The, the thing about science is that it, it gives us understanding of a kind we don't get from anything else. So, in, there's a sense in which even I sometimes want to just sort of close my eyes and say, it's got to happen, because otherwise we're never going to understand ourselves. And that would be a, sort of a, a kind of a tragedy, right? Um, okay. So, so that, all that is just kind of hand-waving. I do think that there is a response to this, 
this is not really a response, it's a kind of a gesture in the direction of response. People forget that ev evolutionary theory is nothing like a natural theory, a natural theory, natural, natural scientific theory of the kind that philosophers have in mind, you know, particle physics and so on, chemistry or whatever. It's a, it's, a, it's a narrative theory, right? It's a historical theory. It can't make predictions. It can only retrodict, explain things, right? It's got all sorts of features that the kind of theories that we think about, the theories we learn, you know, when we're thinking about philosophical models of, of science, it's nothing like that. And yet this is the framework of biology, right? And it's a framework that most people are very happy with. So it's not, it's not like a framework that we're sort of hanging on to temporarily until something better comes along. We're happy with this. Now, it's not to say that anything like evolution will do for the mind. It's merely to say that we don't want to have too narrow a sense of what a scientific theory can be before we give up on a science of the mind. I mean, again, I, I, this is just speculation because I don't know, I'm not at all an expert in any of this stuff, but I do often think that when I, when I, when I read neuroscience papers or go to talks and so on, I often think that um, you know, the more insecure a science is, the more it'll behave like neuroscience, right? This sort of, you know, I mean, for example, even in, you know, Daniel's talk today, that was a wonderful example of, of how a community feels, right? I mean, I don't think in basic physics we go from revolutionary insight to revolutionary insight every five years, right? We have to, we hype our work because we don't feel confident that it's any good, I think, right? Why is it that neuroscientists are so afraid to say anything theoretical? This is now my opinion again, right? I think it's because everyone, it's, everything's up for grabs. No one knows what's certain. And so there's a kind of conservatism built into neuroscience that comes from insecurity. Uh, so I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think it's one reason, again, I'm this is all just armchair psychology. It's nonsense. But I think you know, that's why geneticists, in my opinion, are a little more open to things. Right? They don't, they're not worried about being told they're not real scientists. They are real scientists. Um, and I th so, uh, you know, anyhow. I can go on about this. I think it's, anyhow, never mind. Um, so I agree, I, you know, but what do we do? I mean, we're just, we're doing the best we can. I do think that, um, that you're quite right, though, that if we could, it would be a lot better for the science if we could relax a little bit and admit that, you know, maybe we don't know as much as we think, you know, if we could be a little bit more, as it were, as a community, uh, if, we, if we worried less about where we stand with respect to the NIH or something, uh, I think it'd be a lot better for the science. I mean, I often say to students, um, you know, and a lot of neuroscientists say this too, we're sinking under the weight of data, right? I mean, you know, I mean, again, Daniel's one of, you know, well, it's, it's in a certain way a wonderful position to be in, right? There's more data than, you don't have to collect data anymore. But we could really use a good idea, right? A, a really good idea that might organize the data in a certain way. And again, I don't say this, I'm not making fun. I mean, I, I put myself in the position of everyone else wishing that we had a better idea than, you know, some better ideas than we, we have. Okay, so here's the last one. Uh, I'll just, just take a minute. So, in response to some of the arguments I've given, you know, one thing people say is, but look, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Obviously, you know, we don't have a neuroscientific theory, but obviously the brain's going to be relevant. How, you know, of course it's going to be relevant uh, to understanding the mind. And that I think is perfectly true. I mean, nobody would deny this, right? The question is not whether the brain's relevant. I mean, the question is, what place does it have? What position does it have relative to the other sciences? What sort of combination is the final theory gonna, gonna have? What is it gonna look like? Of course, neuroscience is gonna be there. Uh, the question is, what else is gonna be there? Um, I mean, some people would. Yeah. I mean, the Harnad view? Yeah. I think it's not irrelevant. I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 what I was saying in response to Daniel's paper, I think one of the fascinating things about, about the resting state stuff is it looks like it's beginning to really engage with that objection in a way that, in a certain sense, never happened. So, I mean, let me tell you what I mean. In the 80s, right, there were people, you know, S Steve is an example. I mean, Zane and Politian was the kind of the... the even, even in 2006, there was a paper in Cortex about what has fMRI actually taught us about the mind. Uh, that's a different thing. Is that that's a different thing. I, that I agree with. Okay. Sorry, I better not, I mean, I, I'm friends with Daniel. I don't want to, I mean, um, I mean, I think that is a perfectly, that, I mean, I know the person who wrote that. 
uh, thing, and we'd had discussions about this. I think it is a perfectly, a perfectly defensible position, not necessarily the one I would take, but it's perfectly defensible for someone to say, you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars and the 30 years and all the time and the post none of that has taught us anything new uh, with respect to brain imaging. I think that's a plausible view. I don't say I agree with it, but I think it's plausible. Um, but that's very different to the, to the view you're referring to, according to which no matter how sophisticated the science gets, even if we have a complete science, we could really understand the mind without ever making reference to the brain. So that's a much more radical view. That's a kind of an in-principle view, not a, not a view about kind of where we're at in, in the history of science. Now in the 80s, so, so in the 80s particularly, um, there were lots of people who believed this. Uh, if you want to read somebody really good on this, uh, Zainan Polishin, a Canadian psychologist who works at Rutgers, or he did, I, I don't know, if, does anyone know if he's still alive? He's not that old. Um, he had a book from 82, roughly, called some Cognition and Something. Um, and he had this view, right, that, that if you understand thought in a certain way, namely the way cognitive scientists did, hardcore cognitive scientists, then thought is all about mental function uh, in, the, in the way that function in the sense of computation. Um, and so since you know, brains can compute and silicon can compute and jello can compute and you know, Lego can compute, it's not terribly interesting what's doing the computing. What's interesting is the, the computing itself. That's what the mind is. Everything else is just kind of, as people used to say, do people still say this? Mere engineering, right? That's what people used to say in a deprecating way. Now, in the 90s, people began to say, yeah, it's true that you know, it's cognition is all computation, and the rest of it is mere engineering, but the truth of the matter is, you know, it's quite interesting, or it might be helpful to know what kind of implementation device we have, because some implementation devices are gonna suit one kind of way of doing computation, and other implementations are gonna suit other ways. So for example, if you're Google, and the way you do your work is by having lots and lots and lots of pretty cheap computers, then you might devise certain algorithms for doing things. If, on the other hand, you have, you know, your Walmart and you have a supercomputer, whatever they're called now, then you might write different algorithms, right? So it's kind of useful to know what the hardware is, not because it's essential, but because it kind of constrains to some extent the way the computation is going to be implemented. So people start to say, look, at the very least, we should know whether a theory that we've developed, computational theory, could in principle work in the brain, right? Could the brain actually carry it out? So we should know something about the brain. And so gradually people sort of sh moved away without ever refuting this view. They've moved away from that view just kind of in the way that happens in science and philosophy. People don't realize the view is wrong. They just, they just give it up. They just sort of get bored with it. Um, so I don't think very many people believe that anymore. But there still are, of course, people who think that, you know, it's kind of interesting to somebody how the brain does it, but it's not really interesting to understanding the mind. Yeah, so, okay, so, so let me just say, a kind of, let me answer that question with some slightly more general observations since we're running out of time. So what I want to say about reductionism, so, so I'll get to your question in a sec. So, Am I suggesting that reductionism can't happen? Am I saying here, oh, neuroscience won't ever be the, the theory of the mind? And the answer is definitely no, I'm not saying that, okay? What I'm saying is, we don't know. So what, what, the view that I'd want people to have is the view that it's an open question, right? The whole thrust of looking at the history of science is to say, I don't know, right? Maybe neuroscience will do it, maybe not. We can't make predictions about the future based on some sort of metaphysical intuitions about the structure of the universe, okay? So, I wouldn't want to take the view that you have for the following reason. I myself have a kind of end of days view, an end of days hope, right? I hope that when the seventh seal is opened, what we'll find is a theory of the mind that is indeed a theory of the brain expressed with concepts that we don't yet have. 
In other words, I think it's possible. Do I think it's likely? No, I don't think it's likely. But I think it's possible, and it's the view that I would, it's what I would like to be true, that neuroscientists will eventually develop concepts to talk about brain function that are different from psychological concepts, that add things like culture, social interaction, right? And that genuinely explain mental, mental function better than psychology in the way that molecular biology, right? Um, and so I would not want to say to neuroscience, well, listen, it's, you're just engineering. You know, do the engineering, but don't think too hard. No, what I would love, this is what's missing in neuroscience, except maybe in, in imaging and some, some of the more technical things, right? What's missing in neuroscience is people are saying, look, can we think about brain function in a way that's different from mere implementation? That's just trying to match, to find the neural correlates of X, right? Can we think of brain function in a way that tries to set the psychology aside for a minute, right, and think maybe about new concepts, like the ones that Daniel was talking about. So, sorry, just want to think. So this is a view, it seems to me it's possible that we could in fact have something like that. And there are people who believe, like Noam Chomsky believes that this is the goal of neuroscience, okay? So there are people who believe it, or believe, believe that's what we ought to aim for. And I believe it's what we ought to aim for too. I don't think it's, I think it's going to be a hard, you know, a hard job, but I think I wouldn't want neuroscience to become conservative. So what I, I'd say the correct answer to that question is, well, I don't know, right? So what I want to say is, is it likely to happen? Uh, based on the history of science, probably not. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. So what I want to say is this. This is, in a way, the bottom line. And here's a practical policy application of these ideas. Let it never be said that philosophers are not practical, right? When the NIH says, you know, I don't want to take the resting states up because I actually really like the resting states. When somebody says, let's give $100 million to X to work on long-term potentiation because that is going to be the answer to everything, I think that is wrong. Why? Be not because it might not be the answer. I mean, it might be the answer to everything. What they should say is, listen, science is always a bet, right? You can't do everything. There's a finite amount of money. There's a finite amount of time. Where do we think the most likely progress is going to be made. Let's take a bet on that. Now, if you say that, you're being honest because you're saying, I can't predict where science is going to go. That's the nature of science, right? Great science is revolutionary. It's by definition unpredictable. So I'm going to take a bet on this. And I might lose. What I don't think we should say is, well, look, the mind is the brain, so let's spend all our money on the brain because it's got to be the brain, right? That seems to me bad philosophy. Okay? I mean, and it's not just in this area, by the way. I have a, an old, old friend who's a very distinguished physicist who, who does, he does um, superconductivity. And he, he used to tell me years ago, he would send grants in, and they'd come, you know, they'd come back with, with this. this. This is where I'm on your side, right? They'd come back with, listen, sorry, I mean, we know how, a, how a, you know, we know how an atom works. So just, you know, we know how two atoms work. Just add a lot of atoms. We know how they all work. We don't need superconductivity. He'd say, yeah, but a mole of atoms doesn't behave the way one atom plus one atom plus one atom, right? Or if it does behave in that way, I can't describe it that way. So you get that kind of reductionist impulse, even in something like physics, where people would say, look, everything's made out of atoms. Everything's made out of quarks. We only have to understand quarks. So the, the policy implication here is we ought to be aware and conscious of the fact that we're taking a bet, okay? that the Human Genome Project is not guaranteed at all to deliver what it's supposed to deliver. And so let's not pretend that this cheap metaphysics is going to give us sensible science. I mean, in a certain way, to the extent that the other policy things emerge from this, I mean, it's a kind of anodyne pluralism, but I mean, I do think that is a reason for being pluralistic, right? Because we can't really be very confident, especially now, we can't really be confident in the view that, say, I don't know, brain imaging versus single unit physiology is likely to be more successful. The Churchlands, these people who defend this kind of view, they are very, very important for us because they really do represent a certain kind of view. And among philosophers, they're, they're dissed all the time, right? And I think that's a misunderstanding of what they were up to. If you read particularly Paul Churchland's early paper, papers, 
I think eliminativism, so the eliminativism is the view that you just get rid of psychology and everything is neuroscience. I think that, in fact, I think, I think this is what he has in mind. I think Churchland's, Churchland is coming to grips with the fundamental problem of the relation between psychology and neuroscience. I think he's responding to Davidson, to Davidson's mental events, okay? So, sorry, that was just by the by. I, I think what he's doing is he's, he's coming, he's biting the bullet and saying, if you buy the standard position, the standard philosopher's position about the role of psychology, the relation of psychology and neuroscience, then you're gonna be stuck with a non-science of human beings. And he, that is so offensive that what he says is, okay, then let there be a real science of human beings. We don't have it yet, but it's gotta be neuroscience. And so I think at the very least he's being honest about what it is that he values and what it is that we'd have to do in order to achieve that value. So all of these arguments envisage uh, the kind of end of science time, the millennial, the millennial point in the history of science. In other words, what I'm talking about is, or what people are talking about is, what would a good theory, a complete theory look like? What would, what would a theory that had the status of relativistic quantum mechanics in the mind, in the science of the mind, what would that look like? That's a different question to, to the question of how we get there. Now even the Churchlands, in fact not even the Churchlands, particularly the Churchlands, particularly Pat Churchland, had this view that she called coevolution, by which she meant that in order to get to this point where neuroscience will really explain things, you have to have an interdisciplinary research program because she thought that the only way to actually get there was for neuroscience to talk to psychology, uh, you know, and by psychology we mean anything that might be relevant to understanding human behavior, which then feeds back to neuroscience to better understand the phenomena that we're interested in. So she imagines, uh, imagined a long period of interdisciplinary research which would allow neuroscience to grow to the point where it had the conceptual resources to explain all the things that we really want explained. So it isn't, it isn't the idea is not, let's get rid of all these things so that we have a good theory. The idea was, let's build up the theory so we have, it's as rich as needed in order to explain the complexity of human existence, right? It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a narrow view in that sense. This is my view too. So, sorry, big part. I don't have the view, sorry, let me, so, let me just, so let me back up. I don't have the view that it's inevitable that neuroscience will explain the mind. I don't have that view, neuroscience by itself. I do have the view that interdisciplinary is essential. Not everyone believes that interdisciplinary is intrinsically essential. I mean, you might have the view, I think it's a perfectly okay view that says, look, interdisciplinary is important in order to get to the f whatever understanding we want. There's nothing intrinsically valuable about interdisciplinary. I mean, it's nice. We like to talk to our colleagues in other departments, but that, that again, that's just, it's an empirical question whether that really is the best way to do research. Now, I happen to like interdisciplinarity, but her, her view was, and made more substantive, it was that you, interdisciplinary is required for reasons I could tell you. I haven't explained the reasons. But she thought that the end result of that interdisciplinary was indeed a gradual uh, um, shedding of the concepts of the, of the psychological sciences in favor of neuroscience as neuroscience grows to the point where it can take over the explanation.